little bit as people trickle in. So our speaker today is our own Bob Hazen. He got his undergrad degree at MIT and then moved just up the road to Harvard where he got his PhD and has been at the Carnegie Institution's Geophysical Laboratory for the rest of his career. Um, that said, he's moved around a lot uh, in terms of his career uh, directions and what you're going to see today is I think the, the, the most recent um, evolution in his thinking about the science that fascinates him and the things that he wants to do. He's got a, a if you see in the titles talk, we're, it's an entire team here, I'm going to let him do those introductions as uh, he sees. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Bob, who was right there. Fantastic. Thanks, George. And I'm really delighted to be able to uh, present you today some of our really recent work, really stuff from the last uh, month or two related to deep time data discovery. And to put this in context, uh, this is kind of a special week for us because we've been invited by the director of the National Science Foundation to give their Thursday Distinguished Lecture. Uh, the group of five of us will be going there. Um, and we've been approached about possibly proposing a big NSF center, one of these 10-year centers that we based it at the uh, Carnegie Institution. So it's kind of a big opportunity. So one of the things I'd like to ask you all, please, uh, this is in a sense um, an audition for us. If you have comments, suggestions of any sort, either publicly or privately, please get in touch with us in the next couple of days because Thursday's presentation is a big deal. It's the director, it's three associate directors and 30 program officers who are going to be there reviewing our work. So, so it's a really wonderful opportunity to tell you about this project. Now, the core funding for this comes from the Keck Foundation. It's a program with six co-investigators, including Andy Noel, a paleontologist at Harvard, Dmitry Svrzhensky, geochemist at Johns Hopkins, Paul Falkowski is a geobiologist at Rutgers, our computer science guru Peter Fox at RPI, Bob Downs runs the mineralogy pro program at Arizona, and then we sort of coordinate things at the Carnegie Institution. But where the work really gets done, as I'm sure you understand, is this incredible group of early career people uh, really inspiring to be able to work with them, and you'll hear from four of them today during the course of this presentation. If you'd like to know more about our efforts, please go to our website, Deep Time Data Infrastructure, carnegiescience.edu, and there's a lot of more information about what we're doing. Now, this program really, in a sense, was the outgrowth of a much larger program called the Deep Carbon Observatory. Um, the NSF has asked me to tell a little bit about that program, so I'm going to give you an introduction as well. So the Deep Carbon Observatory is a large international effort. It began um, almost a decade ago. Uh, we had a meeting here in 2008 where we first talked about this. It uh, began formally in September 2009, so we're, we've got about two and a half years to go. It's major support from the Sloan Foundation, $55 million over about an 11-year period. We have more than 1,000 collaborators in 40 countries, many of them here on the Carnegie campus. And it leverages, at this point, more than half a billion dollars in the support worldwide. So this is a big effort. Um, and our goal is to promote a transformational understanding of carbon and Earth. It's physics, it's chemistry, geology, biology, all those different roles from crest to core. We, um, you might say, why carbon? Why focus on carbon? And of course, the obvious answers have to do with things that we know quite well. Carbon is the element of life. It's the element of energy and, and new materials, climate, environment. Those are things that are studied quite well. But maybe less obvious is probably 90% or more of Earth's carbon is buried deep within our planet. And it's largely um, not understood very well. We have a tremendous gaps in our knowledge. We don't know the nature of many of the deep carbon reservoirs. We don't know how carbon moves within the deep interior, uh, much less the rates at which it moves to and from the surface of Earth. So this is an important aspect. And also there's an amazing deep biosphere. By some estimates, at least it approaches the biomass at the surface. So we're trying to understand all these aspects of carbon in an integrated program. We do this through four scientific communities. They're not separate communities because they interact all the time, but we do divide our sort of carbon knowledge into four big groups. Extreme physics and chemistry looks at carbon phases, both fluid and crystalline, at high temperature, high pressure, trying to understand those aspects, fundamental aspects of carbon. Reservoirs and fluxes, which is led by Eric Howery at DTM, um, really focuses on the movements and the reservoirs of carbon 
fairly near the surface uh, through subduction, through volcanism, through diffuse outgassing, the various kinds of influences that may be very important to climate and environment but are not yet fully understood. Deep energy focuses on the fascinating question of deep organic synthesis. For example, the abiotic production of methane and higher, higher hydrocarbons in the lower crust in the upper mantle. These are things that we're now studying rather intensively. And finally, deep life, this whole question of deep microbial life in the deep biosphere. So these are all aspects. And so the four scientific communities are important, but they're also cross-cutting themes. For example, instrumentation. We have field sites. And very important and the subject of my talk today, this idea of data modeling and visualization, which play a key role. So in terms of instruments, we have um, sponsored the design and construction of a whole variety of new instruments from uh, analytical instruments. For example, Dub Grumble has been very important in uh, developing new mass spectrometers. We have field deployment instruments. We have various new kinds of high pressure, high temperature apparatus that have been deployed at national laboratories. So this is one of our big efforts and something we're very proud of. We also have 150 field sites around the world. You can go to our website, deepcarbon.net, and click on this interactive map and learn about all these different sites. I think what I'm most proud of, though, is the early career community that we've developed. Hundreds of scientists from around the world in biology, geology, physics, and chemistry. They interact. They work together. They apply for their own grants. They do their own workshops and, and uh, field sites. They play major leadership roles now all the way up to the executive committee. We are trying to pass on our science to the next generation, and this is a tremendous opportunity. I would love to see this community continue in its efforts as an integrated group. So please visit deepcarbon.net, find out more about the Deep Carbon Observatory. Okay, let's talk about data-driven science. And what we claim is that these large and growing data resources that we're developing in geology and biology, coupled with powerful analytical techniques and visualization methods essentially represent an open access scientific instrument. Anyone anywhere in the world that has a laptop and access to the internet can do the science I'm describing to you today. This is a revolution in the way we think about geology and biology research. In order to achieve this though, we need an integrated approach. We need to take biology, geology, mathematics, computer science. We need to integrate them. We need to advanced science through data-driven discovery. And what I'm going to look at today particularly is the co-evolution of the geosphere and biosphere, a deep time approach to data-driven discovery. In order to achieve these kinds of advances, we need three pillars, and they're all important. We need to create, we need to nurture data resources, databases. It's not glamorous always, but it's really critical. The second thing is you have to have analytical and visualization methods that can probe those data resources. And you have to be asking really interesting questions. Everything has to be framed in a scientific context. Without all three of these pillars, your effort's going to fail. So let me go through these one by one, first talking about the data resources that we've been developing. And there are lots of them and, of course, many others that we're relying on. So, for example, I'm a mineralogist. I'm really interested in the 5,200-plus mineral species on Earth. Now, a mineral species is simply defined as a naturally occurring crystalline material that has a unique combination of chemical composition and crystal structure. So when we talk about the 5,200 mineral species, we're talking about 5,200 distinct combinations of composition and structure. They're all listed on the rough.info database. This is based at the University of Arizona. Bob Downs has run this. It's been largely a labor of love. There's very little financial support for it. You can go here. You can search by chemistry. You can search by structure. And what we've been doing over the last seven years is a brute force addition of mineral evolution data, that is mineral age locality data. This is done by hand paper by paper, mineral by mineral, locality, locality. Josh Golden and Alec Pyers at the University of Arizona are the heroes. They've enlisted an army of undergraduates who help us, um, paid for out of our own pockets. This is the way this sort of thing often happens. And now we have enough data that we can start seeing real trends and do real science with this. 
Complementing that is the mindat.org database. This is a crowdsourced database, largely very experienced and knowledgeable mineral collectors from around the world. There are almost 300,000 localities listed in Mindat now. You can go to each one, find the list of minerals that have been reported from that locality. There are about one million mineral locality pairs, and that number is growing rapidly every week now, thanks to Mindat. There are many other databases that we rely on. EarthChem, which is partly sponsored by the National Science Foundation. There's a petrology database with hundreds of thousands of data related to rocks. Macrostrat, Shannon Peters is involved in that. And this involves uh, sedimentary sections and geological maps. We rely on fossil databases, PaleoBioDB. That's the big paleobiological database. And Drew Massante at Harvard and Mike Meyer at Carnegie are now adding all the Precambrian fossils to this data resource. So that's one of our big efforts. And finally, we really depend on the protein structure database. And you might look at this and say, well, what does this have to do with deep time? But it turns out you can tease out at least some qualitative temporal information by looking at the different kinds of structures. A lot of this is run by Eli Moore and Ben Jelen at Rutgers University. And what you see in a timeline going from modern times all the way back four and a half billion years is that there's a change shown schematically here in Earth's oxygenation. That affects what metals are available and therefore affects the proteins that are derived. The most deeply rooted proteins tend to be re back here, tend to rely on iron. More recent ones have other elements like molybdenum and copper. And we'll come back to this idea of a timeline here, but this is a data resource that we're really interested in. OK, so that's databases. Databases are just archives unless you have interesting analytical and visualization methods. And what I show here, just some of the types of visualizations we're using, chord diagrams, clay diagrams, skyline diagrams, and then we use analytical methods to analyze the data. But what I really want to introduce today is something that we're all very excited about and is rather new to mineralogy, paleontology, and protein work, and that's using network diagrams. Now, social networks have been around for a long time. I'm sure you've heard about them, and the idea is you can show interactions and relationships among many individuals. Here's an Al-Qaeda terrorist network, for example. Well, we do something very similar. We can apply this to fossils. We can apply it to minerals. We can apply it to protein structures and see relationships in a very powerful visual way. So I'll be using a lot of networks throughout today. So a mineral network, for example, a node can be a mineral species. It can be a fossil. It's represented as a circle. A link means that the two minerals or two fossils coexist. And this particular network of chromium minerals, the size tells you how common or rare that mineral is. The color tells you how it formed, for example, igneous or metamorphic. So you'll be seeing a number of networks today. Here's a rather intuitive one. This is a paleobiology or a fossil network. These are families of dinosauria. And you'll see four colors because there's reptilia, there's birds, and there's the two groups of dinosaurs. And what you see here then are coexisting families of different organisms colored by the type. One thing that's very dramatic is you see the color changes up here. These are sort of the earliest types of dinosaurs and reptiles. And if you go through the network, you're actually seeing a timeline ending up with modern birds. So the interconnections tell you something about which organisms coexisted together, and the timeline just falls out. Here's another network which I think is very dramatic. This is one showing all kinds of coexisting families for the last 540 million years. Again, this clusters very, very nicely into the earliest fauna, the Paleozoic, which takes us up to about 250 million years, then the Mesozoic and going into the modern times. So we'll come back to this kind of diagram. But I think you can see that a network diagram embeds a lot of information. Let's think about mineral networks. Here's a rock, a granite, and it consists of coexisting minerals. So you can think about these four minerals, in this case, typical granite minerals. And here's a network that contains 35 minerals from all sorts of igneous rocks. The four we just looked at are right here. And you can represent those. So there's granite. Here's Nephilim cyanite. Indeed, all of igneous petrology is embedded in this network diagram. So it's incredibly powerful. We're going to come back to this, but I want to introduce Ahmed Alish. 
He's a graduate student at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He's here for about nine months working with our data science team. He's an amazing coder. Get to know him. If you have questions about coding and Jupyter Notebooks and so forth, he is the master. So Ahmed, I'm going to turn it over to you and show people how we actually do some of these networks. Thank you, Bob. So allow me to sort of quickly step through the process that we go through to prepare our data um, that we get from all these different resources and get them in the right form for these analyses and visualizations. There it is. So to do this, I'll be using a Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter is a data science platform that is uh, freely available and open source and allows you to write in one of maybe up to 40 programming languages. It is very conducive for sharing um, you know, notebooks across uh, it, the users and doing different analyses and presenting your outputs or results within one flowing um, uh, page, let's say. So I will read in some data, just a sort of another day at the office for me, and I will start processing this data and get it into a form where we could generate a network out of it. So the kinds of data that we're working with, as Bob has mentioned, so each one of these cells contains some code, some code reads data, some code cleans data, and so on. I'll be stepping through them. Um, as Bob has mentioned, the data that we're working on are localities on Earth and minerals that have been found there. So for example, in localities, their names are there, they have IDs in the database, and then a list of minerals that have been found at these localities. And so we, we do quite a bit of processing. You know, this is, um, uh, we split them apart, and then I have a locality and the mineral that's been found there. I do some aggregation to, you know, uh, to go over all the data and find which minerals had coexisted with others, and then build a sort of new structure that describes this. So more data processing. We get this, a coexistence matrix, which is uh, on the columns and the rows, you have all the list of minerals within your data set, and then each number represents how often these minerals occur together, basically the number of localities in which they coexist. We also build, let's say, a list of our nodes, which are all the minerals that we have in our database, and we use, we, we again pull data from different resources to categorize or classify the minerals to give them different groupings, different ways that we could identify with them within the diagram, or that you know we could um, describe how, how minerals of dif similar or different types get together or coexist um, in nature. This is we d where we do most of the processing, where I take this coexistence matrix and convert it into what we call an edge list, which, is, which describes just the edges in the network, so which node connects to which node, and we try to quantify the relationship between the minerals as, you know, the minerals that coexist with together a lot are closer or should be closer together, have a, um, a shorter distance between them in the network. So a little bit of processing and that is done. And this is what the edge list will look like. Quartz, orthoclase, and then a value that quantifies this relationship. Um, obviously, um, the higher the value, the more, um, the more they coexist. And this will be used in the network to sort of bound the distances between the nodes so that it's expressive of the relationship. I just built a data object that I will use to display the graph and finally, what you're probably waiting for, this. So this is a network um, that's been built out of the, again, um, the Johansson data set, which is a data set of igneous rocks as well. Um, so this one is not interactive because I'm just showing it within you know, the, the, the notebook and how that we use just for mostly for processing the data analysis. But then we can take this structure now and display it in a number of other ways in web browsers that's more interactive, that you can use uh, filters to uh, sort of look at different categorizations or groupings or different levels of density of the network. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed, very much. So what you see then is we have a variety of ways of rendering these networks. Here's a three-dimensional form called multidimensional scaling. There are 51 different rock-forming igneous minerals here. It turns out this is a projection from 50-dimensional space down to three dimensions. And what you'll see is minerals that occur together commonly, like quartz and topaz, are close together. Things that never occur together are as far apart as possible. That's like quartz and nepheline. And so you can render this as a, a three-dimensional diagram and learn a lot of information. But remember, this is a projection from 50-dimensional space. Mathematically, we can treat it at those higher dimensions. 
We can also go back to two-dimensional form and start thinking about relationships amongst this. And every igneous phase diagram and igneous sequence has to be here. For example, Bowen's reaction series. We've all learned about this, where you have a sequence from high temperature to low, where there's a plagioclase trend, there's a mafic trend of magnesium iron minerals, there's a late stage trend, and indeed embedded in the network diagram has to be those trends. There's the late there plagioclase, there's mafic, there's late stage, there's whole Bowen's reaction series embedded in the diagram. And if we could see this at higher dimensions, it would be even clearer. Also, phase relations. Here, for example, the anorthite forced right quartz relations. These are things that were determined at the Geophysical Laboratory 100 years ago. A part of our history embedded in this is a network of coexisting phases. That network has to be present in the network diagram. And indeed, what we suggest is that if you go to the higher dimensional levels, if you're looking at equilibrium assemblage, all of phase equilibria for igneous rocks is present in this diagram and can be extracted. Furthermore, thermochemical information can probably be extracted as well. Now, for igneous rocks, we already know the phase equilibria, so that perhaps is not all that shocking. But there are many, many systems in mineralogy where no one's done the experimental work, but if we have equilibrium phase assemblages and we can extract that, the networks can provide us, they can point us to phase relations, and not just in three or four dimensions, but in eight or ten dimensions. So we have an opportunity here to extract information that's never been seen before in these diagrams. Here's another diagram, another way of rendering that 51 igneous minerals. What you'll see here is a relationship where each node size represents the frequency of occurrence. The node spacing corresponds to how frequently those minerals occur together. We've colored these by structure groups, so quartz and feldspar in red, the feldspathoids in orange. And here again, we have a layout in which every distance is represented by a spring. And so this is a flexible, adjustable network. And just to show you a movie of this, you can actually take these nodes and see what's linked to what. You can, you know, I say play with these for hours, but there's an incredible amount of information embedded in one of these networks. And if you really want to study a system that you're familiar with, you can learn a huge amount because you can look at all 51 phases here in multidimensional space simultaneously. So this is a really exciting opportunity, and we think there's a great future for it. Now, there's another aspect to networks. These aren't just pretty pictures. There is a whole field of network metrics. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail today, but density has to do with how densely interconnected things are, what percentage of the total number of possible links is represented. Diameter is essentially the degrees of separation. You're talking about six degrees of separation. Most of these networks for igneous minerals on Earth, Mars, Moon, and Vesta, which Shauna Morrison has put together, are much lower diameters. And their other degree centralization has to do with um, how important individual nodes are to linking all the rest of the nodes. So there's all sorts of metrics we can use to compare and contrast. It makes this a much more quantitative field. One of the exciting things is, is how much we don't know and how many frontiers are opening to us. So I'm going to present throughout this talk some unanswered questions. In this case, we're wondering if we can extract phase information, thermochemical information from the networks. We want to know for the networks of fossils and proteins, is there an implicit timeline always embedded in an evolving system? We want to know what local and global metrics are best describe these geology and biology networks. There's lots of different choices, and we haven't explored them all. And we'd love to be able to implement interactive three-dimensional videos, that is, where we can actually walk into a cave environment with three-dimensional goggles, grab onto the nodes, and sort of walk around and see what's where. It's a fascinating possibility and absolutely doable right now. So this is the future of this. It's not just two-dimensional renderings on a computer screen. For the rest of the talk, I want to share with you four short stories. Uh, these are all things that we've been discovering very recently and is really exciting to us. Um, this should give you a flavor of the kinds of things you can do with deep time data. So I'm going to look at the supercontinent of Rodinia with Chao Liu. We're going to talk about mass extinctions during the Ediacaran period with Mike Meyer. The timing of protein evolution, work done by our Rutgers group. And then the idea of predicting as yet undiscovered mineral species and ore deposits using big data with Shauna Morrison. So these four stories each represent how we can use big data. So 
Chao Liu is going to be telling us some things about his geochemistry and mineralogy. Let me give you an introduction to this idea. So Rodinia was a supercontinent. There are five stages in Earth's history where it's assumed that supercontinents have come together, the continents have come together to form one landmass. Here's the most recent one. It goes through rather quickly, but about 250 million years ago, uh, the continents all came together to form Pangaea. You'll see them being separated, and there is the supercontinent, and now these sort of separate into the modern era. So you can imagine periods when continents come together, when they, se when they separate apart, and if you think about that process of bringing continents together, there are mountain forming events which cause intense mineralization. One of the consequences is the formation of zircon crystals, which are preserved through more than three and a half billion years of Earth history. You see five different episodes of mineralization, and there's Rodinia at about 1 billion to 1.2 billion years ago. So this is one of the episodes of supercontinent assembly. But there's a little bit of uh, trickiness here, because when you look at those peaks, you're seeing a combination of two competing effects. One is the formation of new minerals during periods of approach and collision, but the other is the loss of minerals through erosion after you form mountains and as you're breaking up the continents. And so when you see those peaks, you're seeing this sort of coupled effect. Now, let's look at other elements. These are 60,000 age data for transition metal minerals, the first row transition like iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and so forth. And what you see is very clear peaks underneath each of these supercontinent assembly periods. Those are for each billion year period the largest peak. But if you look at Rodinia, that's really a puny little peak, not nearly as prominent as the peak for zircon. And if we look at other elements, there's nickel. And there's almost nothing during the Rodinian assembly. But what Chow found is if you look at niobium, there's a huge peak. So what's going on here? Some elements like, like zirconium and niobium seem to be very, very strongly correlated. So Chow did this heroic effort of going into EarthChem, looking and extracting trace element data for 100,000 igneous rocks and looking at those elements through time. And what he found for a couple of the elements, particularly, look at niobium. Look at that peak at, I mean, that's, that's a real anomaly in Earth history. What's going on with Rodinia? Now, before I go further, I want Chow to tell you exactly how he extracts this data from um, EarthChem, because that, that's sort of the key to the, the whole process. So Chow Liu got his PhD at Yale University. He came to us a couple years ago as a postdoctoral research associate. He's been working with our data science team ever since. So, so Chow, thanks. Uh, I will briefly describe how I uh, process the geochemical data. So the, the, the data I, I process it from uh, earthchem.org. Uh, you can go to the website and there is a access data button and there's earthchem portal. And you can just search the, the portal and uh, uh, there are many uh, kinds of queries you can, you can do like um, age, like uh, 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 drug type and you know uh, the, the uh, chemical uh, chemistry, and uh, you can see that the EarthCam has uh, uh, is a portal for uh, for several different uh, databases, including uh, Navdat, uh, PetDB, GeoRock, USGS, and everything. So you can just uh, download the data from uh, uh, based on your queries from EarthCam, and when you have that data, you go to you know like our old friend uh, Jupyter no Notebook. I uh, wrote this um, uh, code uh, uh, using Python. And uh, here is how I do it. Uh, so you just read into the uh, read read the uh, data into the uh, uh, into Jupyter, and you you have like uh, one thirty uh, thousand um, uh, zirconium raw data here, and you need to actually filter everything uh, because for for some. Uh, for some uh, data, it's, it's, it's not uh, reported in PPM, it's reported in PPB, and you need to divide it by 1,000, that's for sure. And also, for some samples, it's like the, uh, they don't have a, a, a digit um, a latitude or longitude number, you need to process that. Also, I'm, I only care about the rocks that has a fairly precise age, which is the uh, plus minus 100 million years. I don't. I don't want to pre process some 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 data with uh, uh, you know uh, 
maximum like three billion and minimum like uh, zero point five billion something like that. So after this filtering, you have like uh, one uh, one hundred eleven thousand data points for the conium. And um, um, so you have the raw uh, samples, and but you you don't want to just plot them on the plot uh, because um, uh, you uh, you need to assign a weight for different samples. For example, uh, for example, you know uh, the samples from North America is 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 abundant, but sample from like uh, Antarctica is 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 very scarce. You need to s assign a higher weight for the sample from. Uh, uh uh, an Arctic for sure. You want to, uh, you know, minimize the sampling bias. So this is how I did it. Uh, you calculate the distance, you calculate the age difference, and you you calculate. Uh, you just you know calculate the weight uh, for each different sample. And uh, you know after this process, you have like uh, you have the weight, you have everything, and uh, you have the the age. It has an error, and you need to resample everything. From that, based on the weight, and also you need to reassign, uh, reassign an age for the, for the samples with a uh, with an error, and uh, and and uh, then you get everything, and you just plot everything. Uh, you, I want to, uh, I I actually that's that is the result. So this is the conium uh, through time. Uh, so the the red uh, solid line is the average, and also I calculated a uh, 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 ninety five uh, percent uh, competence level uh, based on the t test uh, from the average, and also the the solid blue line is the median value, and the 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 dashed. Uh, um, the dashed uh, line uh, means the the uh, the first quantile and the third quantile, which is uh, you can see that there is a clearly there is a peak uh, during Rodinia assembly for zirconium. I th and so this is the case for also for Niobe and also other elements. Great. So. Thank you very much, Chow. So you can see there's quite an involved process to get a diagram of this sort, but it gives us tremendous constraints on this unusual period of Rodinia assembly. So as we've seen, niobium is very high during Rodinia, zirconium. We also look at yttrium. There's another peak for yttrium right at this period. And so here we have three high field strength elements that show great abundance. But at the same time, when you look at nickel and cobalt, when you look at gold, the platinum group elements, many other elements that commonly form minerals, when Chow does the same analysis, there is no anomaly. There certainly is no great uh, valley here. So for, in this case, nickel and cobalt, we see no anomalies. So what's going on with rodinia? There's one other piece of information you need to know that rodinian age rocks are largely expressed by what's known as the Grenville orogeny. It's a band of rocks. This is the paleo reconstruction. But when we look at those rocks today, they're all typically very high metamorphic grade, representing 10 kilometers or more of erosional loss. This suggests that the Rodinian assembly was very rapid. It formed an extremely high mountain range, perhaps higher than the Himalayas today, and that there was subsequent rapid erosional loss. So here's our hypothesis that the Rodinia had an unusually high input from enriched sources that concentrated these high field strength elements like niobium, zirconium, and yttrium. But at the same time, the unusually high mountains experienced major erosional loss. So you stripped off most of those mineral forming deposits, would have, which would have been in the upper 10 kilometers of the crust. And that's what we're seeing here, a very different supercontinent assembly. Of course, there are many unanswered questions. We'd love to be able to quantify the extent of that erosional loss. We'd like to know something about the effect of rodinia on biological evolution, because certainly when you have a supercontinent like that, it must have some effect. We'd like to know about statistical methods that best reveal the maximum and minima in the type of calculations Chow is using. And then using machine learning to expand our geochemical databases rather than having to do these by brute force. That would be great. OK, a second short story. This has to do with the Ediacaran period. This is the first period in Earth's history where multicellular organisms arose, 575 to about 542 million years ago. This is work that's been pioneered by Mike Meyer here at Carnegie, Drew Macenti at Harvard, and our 
computer science helper is Anirudh Prabhu at RPI, and they've done some really interesting work, as I think you'll see. So this enigmatic Ediacaran fauna, you know, what are these things? Are they jellyfish-like? Uh, certainly they're thought to be animals, but they occur lots of different places on Earth, but it's really not clear what they are. This was before the Cambrian explosion. Now, let's look at once again at this network of fauna from the last 542 million years. And what you see in a network diagram like this are families of coexisting animals where each of these nodes represents a family, and the lines connecting them represent two coexisting families. So that's the only information that goes into this diagram. But what falls out without any age information at all is a timeline. We think that may be characteristic of networks of evolving systems. What you also see very clearly is the mass extinction event at the end of the Permian, a pinching off point where you see new fauna, new families coming in. There's two other pinch off points, and we suspect that this, this massive faunal overturn probably also represents an aspect of mass extinctions. We have to explore this, but it looks like networks are telling us about mass extinctions. OK, so let's look in detail about the Ediacaran. We have the Avalonian, that's the oldest of three zones, faunal zones, from 575 to 560. There's a group of characteristic animals in fossil form. Then you see a rather different fauna in the White Sea, and finally, the Nama Association. Now the question is, what distinguishes these three zones? Is there an extinction event, or is it just a, basically a facies change, where they're representing you know, offshore, near shore, shore, shallow water, deep water fauna, and you're seeing a difference of facies as it is. OK, to answer this, Mike and Drew have done a heroic job of putting together a database of all of the Ediacaran fossils. There are 95 localities. There's 98 genera. This is a big data set. And when you do that, you form a network. So here's the network seen for the first time in public. Um, we have the Avalonian in green up there. There's the White Sea group here. There's also the Nama group. And there's a lot of structure in this. And before we go further, I'm going to let Mike tell you something about how this network was formed and what he sees in it. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is our now our, our dynamic uh, network. And so you can see if I poke around, the whole thing moves. Um, and it may try to escape at times. It's a wily network. Um, so we have our three groups here. Uh, again, just going over the colors. Uh, the green represents this earliest assemblage, the Avalon assemblage. Um, it's uh, found in very deep water. Uh, the orange is our White Sea, or Ediac otherwise known as Ediacaran assemblage. That's this middle one, fairly shallow. Uh, and then the red is our Nama, um, which is even more shallow, but it's also our latest. The blue represents um, of organisms that are found in more than one of these assemblages. And for the most part, um, the blue in this main area here uh, represents uh, overlap between the Nama and the White Sea. Uh, with these uh, three right here, especially at this pinch point, uh, being overlaps between the Avalon and, and the White Sea. And so uh, definitely this, this pinch point here really shows up very obviously. Um, there uh, is definitely a facies difference, this uh, deep versus shallow. Um, but it's you know, interesting that none of these guys really make it over there other than, than these uh, few. So you'd expect, even with a deep water, shallow water um, difference, that there should be representatives of some of these other groups, which is uh, pretty a pretty decent uh, amount of organisms to go further uh, elsewhere. Um, one of the big questions uh, has been about what uh, goes on toward the end of the Cambrian, uh, sorry, the end of Ediacaran toward the beginning of the Cambrian. Uh, a lot of these organisms, we don't actually know um, what the relationship is to organisms in the Cambrian. Where, where do they go? Um, and from there, I'll let uh, Bob speak. Thank you. Push the button. OK, so if you were looking for a mass extinction event, where would you place it? 
Um, certainly, we think that there's something going on there. Uh, we could call it a massive faunal turnover, perhaps, whether that's an extinction or a facies change. And we're still debating amongst ourselves exactly what this means. But I think it's kind of an exciting idea that with all those fauna and all those localities, it's really hard just to look at a table and pick this out. With a network, you can see it right away. So different facies and extinction events may affect these assemblages. OK, lots of questions remain, of course. Uh, what are the roles of facies change in apparent biological diversity in a network. What are these animals? Can we figure that out? That's another whole question. What network metrics best characterize mass extinctions? Is there a way of sort of automatically finding mass extinctions in paleo data? And could we use three-dimensional visualizations here to get more details? OK, let's talk about a third story. This has to do with protein evolution and the influence of geochemistry. Again, work by Eli Moore, Ben Yellen at Rutgers University. If we look at the last four billion years of Earth's history and think about ocean chemistry, the trace elements have changed because of changes in oxygenation. Early on, iron was very high in the oceans. But after the great oxidation event, iron dropped down to very, very low levels as they are today in the ocean. By contrast, copper started very low, but through time rose to a much higher level. In fact, the scales are weird here, so copper is up here someplace. So we see this transition point, and proteins must reflect that because they use these metals in critical biological functions. So when we look, you've seen this diagram before, when we look at the oldest, most deeply rooted proteins, they use iron in their active site. More recent proteins use copper. OK, so you can do this in all sorts of ways. You can build trees that are based on protein structures. If you have a metal site, the amino acids fold themselves around it and pull those metal sites into a perfect electronic configuration. If you compare different fold structures of different proteins, you can see which are similar and which are very different. But I think the most dramatic way to show this is an amazing diagram produced by Jana Bromberg at Rutgers with almost 5,000 protein fold structures. Each one of these nodes represents a protein and its fold structure. Two nodes that are close together have fold structures that are similar. Nodes that are far apart have very different fold structures. And the thing is, independently, just have colored each of these different proteins by the metal that occurs within the protein. And there you see at one end iron, at the other end copper. There's no age information here whatsoever, but there is a timeline built into this network. And what's really exciting is all this blue here. This is the manganese bearing proteins, including photosynthetic proteins. They appear to be temporarily right in the middle. Now, we don't have an exact you know, quantifiable timeline yet, but that's what we're working on. So this is a really exciting direction. We want to know if we can actually tweak that ocean geochemistry by using trace elements in various seafloor minerals. We want to see what the biological functions are of many other proteins that are, their functions are not yet known, but they have metals. So that's certainly additional information. We want to know about higher dimensional analysis of a network like that with 5,000 nodes. You really want to see it in more dimensions. And what are the visualization methods might we use to compare these fold structures? That's the kind of direction we're thinking about. OK, fourth and last short story. This is the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart because it has to do with mineralogy. And we want to know if we can discover new minerals. OK, so here we're going to use a different kind of network, something called a bipartite network. I know you've seen these. This is a spread of viral disease where this might be a hospital or an airport. And you see individuals and in spreading the disease to another hospital or airport. So in black are the locality nodes. In colors are people in this particular diagram. We're doing the exact same kind of thing where we have minerals and their localities. So in this particular network, in colors are different minerals, very, very common minerals with large circles, calcite and malachite. Rather rare is the barium carbonate witherite. Extremely rare, known from only one locality, is cozoite. That's a lanthanum carbonate. And in black are the localities. And to explain this network di diagram more is Shauna Morrison. Uh, she got her PhD very recently at the University of Arizona, came to work at Carnegie as a postdoctoral fellow doing both planetary science. She's on the Mars rover team and with mineralogy as well. Thanks, Shauna. Hi. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, so here, again, we're looking at that uh, carbon bipartite network. Uh, so these black nodes here are representing localities. Um, you can see how this looks when we manipulate it. And these colorful nodes are representing individual mineral species. Um, so Ahmed mentioned earlier that we can color or size or shape these nodes um, basically on any parameter that we want. Uh, in this case, we're doing it on uh, the number of localities that they occur at. That's what they're colored on. You can see the scale here. But we could do it on chemistry. We could do it on, um, say, age. So let's, you can see a few of the options we have here. We could do it on hardness. Uh, but let's look at it colored on age. So Bob has mentioned that a number of these networks show, just naturally show timelines without including any time information. Um, and you can see if we color these nodes on times with uh, red being greater than four billion years old, uh, moving up to blue being much more modern, we could see more or less we're seeing that trend here within this carbon network. Thanks, Shona. Yeah, this is really striking, the fact that even though there's no age information whatsoever in building the network, a timeline seems to appear. And so it looks like mineral evolution data is embedded in this. That's just one of the discoveries we've made in the last few weeks. OK, so the other thing that you see here is a very dramatic distribution of minerals from big surfaces. These are common minerals, and there are a few common minerals but there are a huge number of tiny circles on the outside that are rare. Another thing, by the way, the symmetry, the, the symmetry, this bilateral symmetry has never been seen in a bipartite network before. We do not understand the deep mathematical significance of that, but we're studying that. That's just a, that's just a whole thing in network theory that's, that's fascinating as an aside. So most carbon minerals are rare. A few are common. And this is just like the distribution of words in a book. So we now are looking at this from a mathematical point of view. Our mathematician at Purdue University Northwest Greta Heistead has been trying to fit functions to this. What we realize that in literature, if you have a book, there are a few words that are extremely common, like a, and, and the. But the vast majority of words are only used once or twice. And this gives you a distribution. Here, now we're talking about the number of localities at which a mineral occurs. And there are very few minerals that occur at tens of thousands of localities, more that occur at thousands or even hundreds of localities. But when you have minerals that occur at exactly three localities known on Earth, 8% of all species, and 22%, almost a quarter of all mineral species on Earth, are known from only a single locality. That is a large number of rare event distribution. It can be represented by this kind of graph, where in black you see exactly one locality, more than 1,000 species. Exactly two localities, approximately 600 species. In black is the observed, red our model. It's a GIGP type of LNRE distribution for those who are technically uh, interested in that. And basically this allows you to say, if you discover one more mineral at one more locality, what is the probability of it being a new mineral? And of course, that probability goes down and down and down as you discover more and more minerals. Here's the accumulation curve. You can extrapolate into the future. We predict that there are 1,500 minerals that are missing. Now, this was done in February of 2015 when there were approximately 650,000 known localities. We're now up to a million, and that's where we are. We're dead on the line. So the prediction so far is held true. OK, we can do this for individual elements. We've done it for carbon minerals. We published this in 2015 to describe that there are approximately 145 missing carbon minerals. We predicted what many of those would be based on analysis of which minerals would have carbon or uh, sodium or oxygen or hydrogen accompanying them. So we're able to make that prediction. We began what's called the Carbon Mineral Challenge. It's an international effort and run by uh, various prominent mineralogists in a dozen different countries looking for new minerals. So here's the chart. First one we found was abelliite, described early 2016. It's one of the specific minerals we predicted in our paper and published. So that was a good thing. There's the second one that was found, tenunculite. And I am going to have to confess that we did not predict this one. And the reasons I think will become clear, there's a picture of a falcon. Um, Tenunculite only exists when the excrement of a falcon bakes in the hot gases of a coal fire. OK, so we didn't predict it. We did predict that there'd be eight missing 
organic minerals. So I guess this is one of them, but that's just one of the wonderful things about mineralogy. And then uh, one of the most recent ones, parasite, that's another one that we predicted from Brazil. So we're actually predicting the existence of new minerals. We're going out and we're finding these new minerals. This is a very exciting development in mineralogy. I think we can do the same thing with ore deposits. And we're meeting with the United States Geological Survey Resource Division. We're having a several day long workshop in just three weeks from now where we're going to actually apply these statistical methods to the search for new ore deposits. Okay, so there's many, many questions. What geological characteristics most influence this mineral occurrence? We want to be able to predict, so we need to know those things. We think this LNRE distribution is something unique to Earth. Perhaps it's a biosignature. We don't see it on Mars. We don't see it on the Moon. So that's a really exciting possibility that we have a biosignature, a planetary biosignature in the distribution of minerals. We want to know what functions best characterize the locality mineral data. Not all LNRE models fit. And we'd really like to get some interactive 3D holographic um, designs of this. So we have many questions that are going on. OK, I've, I know this has been a whirlwind tour. I've talked to you about different data resources in the, and using networks. We've looked at supercontinent of Virginia. We looked at possible mass extinction in the Ediacaran. We've looked at a timeline for protein evolution. And we've looked at prediction of new minerals and ore deposits. These are all made possible because we have large and growing data resources. We have very powerful analytical and visualization methods. And we've been asking questions based on this idea of co-evolving geosphere and biosphere. What we think we have, this is going to be an open access instrument for discovery. Anyone anywhere in the world with a laptop, with access to the internet, anyone in this room can do exactly what we've shown you today. This is an instrument that will be incredibly powerful for discovery. What we need, though, to really bring this to fruition is an integrated program that we can advance data-driven discovery by looking at the geo and the bio data resources by applying mathematical methods and having powerful computer science infrastructure to drive the whole thing forward. So with that, I want to thank our funding agencies, the Keck Foundation, the Deep Carbon Observatory, the Astrobiology Institute of NASA, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and of course, the Carnegie Institution's Geophysical Laboratory. So with that, thank all of you, my collaborators, and hope there might be time for questions. Questions? And please address them to any of my colleagues as well. The, you know, this is this falls out of the particular algorithms that are all open access. So the force director or the multidimensional scaling algorithms, they give you the network. And and actually, Ahmed, maybe you can tell me because this is something I wondered. How do you decide which projection to use in these networks? Well, uh, so we say multidimensions uh, as in <coughs> each, each mineral is represented as a vector of, you know, a present or absence in localities, correct? And so from that, we get to, you know, relationships between each mineral and the other mineral. So again, each mineral now is represented as a vector of, of existence with other minerals. So you have uh, 51 minerals in your data set. Each one of those is a 51 vector uh, 51 unit vector that describes of ones and zeros that describes whether or not this mineral coexists with all these others and then you um, y you just do a many body simulation to try to uh, place these minerals the, all these locations uh, all these um, so sorry nodes uh, on a two-dimensional configuration so that the nodes that are coexisting uh, are closer to each other and those that, that are not are further apart so it's attractive and repulsive, repulsive forces, as Bob said, sort of uh, like a spring-like system, where all the nodes compete for location. You know, so it, their relationships with each other is really what defines how the, the end layout looks like. But it's certainly true that you can manipulate the node, and you can twist it, you can change it, you can actually move some nodes from one place to another. So there's there's multiple projections that are possible with any of these these layouts. So, I mean, this is a very exciting and opens up a new possibility. So my, uh, my, uh, I'm wondering, uh, obviously, is data-driven is, is based on how you input data, right? So question is uh, how you're reiterating between 
the operator who collect all the data and the finding, you know, I mean, obviously there's the wrong data being input, uh, int entered and how you discover that or, you know, some data is not accurate enough and how, how this process is iterating. I mean, that's, uh, that's um, my questions. That's a great question and, and any one of us could give our own sort of personal answers. The first thing is how we do this is we go to RPI or RPI comes to us and we sit down for hours and hours and hours and we look at our data and our data objects, put them into a format that can be inhaled into these existing programs and then tweaking it, you know, what colors do we want to use, what sizes do we want to use, what, what distances do we put in and then you'll find out there's some outlier point that doesn't make any sense and you'll look at that and you'll go back and look at the data. Massaging the data takes days in some cases. Chow, I mean, how many days did you spend working just to produce the one from EarthChem producing one of those diagrams? I mean, uh, it's like a week or more in some cases. One or two months, the first one. Uh, Sean has spent two months building a copper data set. Um, this is this is the dull part. This is this is the boring part. This is the thing that nobody wants to fund. There's no funding agencies that will pay you to build the data object. But if you don't have the data object, you can't do the science. So, so Mike, describe how you did the Ediacaran. I mean, this is 95 localities and 98 genera that are published in, in wide numbers of papers in the literature. So here, give thanks, Bill. Yeah, for, uh, for the Ediacaran um, uh, database uh, of, of fossils, if you actually go to the paleobio database, um, they, they have all of their data right up there on the front to show. Uh, they actually hide the Precambrian stuff to the side because it's it's a very odd time. Fossils are not well as uh, well as well understood then. Um, so uh, we put together um, our database from uh, the own people within our field because we had the best data that wasn't on this publicly accessible one. Um, all of our data will be on there soon, um, but we worked with a bunch of collaborators to bring all of this uh, together. Um, and then had to go through and, and make sure it was all standardized. So that was uh, us working on it, kind of uh, out on our own. Though that will be incorporated into the greater the greater literature. Um, and of course, through all of our data sets, you know, there's obvious biases that we have to work with with when the data is input, and that's something that we've strove to correct or um, act with. Um, I think from day one. Yeah, so for example, in the mineral evolution database, we've built that ourselves and extremely paranoid about adding any information that might be wrong. But with MINDAT, for all the localities, this is a collector-based data. So they might be going on, they find a nice piece of malachite, which is bright green. They say, oh, I found malachite at this locality. But they don't bother to live the quart list the quartz and the feldspar, which are also at that locality because they don't care about it as a, as a collector. So we, we, there are huge biases in that kind of data. Uh, but we can talk more about how we handle biases. That's, that's something that you really have to be thoughtful about. By the way, there's a funny expression that, that data science is doing science with other people's data. Um, and I think that's misleading. I mean, the best data scientists actually do science with the data that they have also accumulated, and in some cases, data that's entirely their own, building your own database. So the rough database, all of the mineralogical data in there is actually stuff that has been done at University of Arizona and, and added in there the structures and the Raman spectra and, and many of the other data are, are, are recollected so that they're completely confident. But of course, that's not always possible. I just I, I want to say that for geochemical data, there's a big advantage because we have much more data points. And you can just do statistics, right? And even though you have like outliers. You, you, you are looking at the average, the media, everything. So the outliers, they don't have a huge significance on the, on the output, I think. Yeah, of course, with, ge with geochemical data, again, if you're looking at rock data, if you look at a geographical distribution, you have a huge amount of data from North America and Europe. You have very little data from Asia um, and, and 
in other parts of the world, South America, for example. So there are geographical biases that are just based on where people live and who's done the work. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jerry Barton. I'm retired a long time from NOAA. Uh, this is absolutely the most exciting thing I've seen in, in a long time. I saw the Alvarez's present the uh, extinction at uh, downtown when they did that. So this, this rivals that. Um, I worked in, this covers so many uh, areas uh, that I worked in from observations at the Naval Oceanographic Office and presenting data for use, and then databases and data discovery and uh, at, at the national level, at NOAA level, at the national level, and at the international level. It puts it all together. Uh, and this is like a big birthday present for me, actually, to see all of this come together. I'll be 75 tomorrow, and you know, all, all, oh, the, work congratulations. Did, all the work that I did is here in, in spades. So it's really, really marvelous. So I'm very pleased to see this. I appreciate that. I think you can see how passionate we are about this and feel that it's an incredible compliment. I mean, all the data that's produced over the years at, at the Geophysical Laboratory at DTM. Um, when you add that data to data resources and can mine it in this way, it, it takes it to a different level because it means we're all participating in a much more global thing. If people keep their own little data sets to themselves, they're seeing a very small part of the world. Um, this integration is really a, a very powerful. Well, and, and, and to second that, um, you know, we showed uh, our group members, our collaborators at the beginning, and you can't have anything like this uh, without them. I mean, we, we'd like to give a big, you know, shout out to all of them because everyone has a background that is, is a key link in this. No one, there's no one that's excess on this. Everyone has just added and just done some amazing work with this. And, and for someone to be able to do this, it's not a lone actor at all. It is, it is by far a work of many uh, toward a singular goal. Yeah, but if you are doing your own work and would like to see if there's a link to us, please come and talk to us because that's what, what we love to do. And also, it could be part of this new center if you're interested in that. Again, I'll ask you if you have any comments at all, um, as critical as possible uh, for this presentation. Thursday is, is sort of a big day for us, and we want to make it as good as possible. Um, um, and your feedback would be really helpful in that regard. Yes. We're going to do the same team presentation. Nobody can do it by themselves. This is really a team effort, and, and I thank my colleagues. Uh,